welcome to the House of Prayer. I am so happy to be back, and I'm so happy to see all of you, especially Brother Mervyn. Good to see you all again. Today we're going to continue our series on the names of God, and we're going to look at Adonai, which means Lord and Master. And I truly and honestly believe that today's talk is going to change your lives beyond recognition. Of course, it's conditional on one thing, that you hear, that you understand, and that you put what you learn into practice. But before we get to any of that, I'm going to hand you over to Brother Mervyn, who's going to lead us in a few minutes of worship. Please open your hearts, close your eyes, and just let the Spirit take you into the presence and the heart of God. Brother Mervyn, thank you for being with us. Over to you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you now. Our souls are weary. Only you can make us alive, Lord. You can. You have the power to set our lives on fire. So move within us, Lord. Teach us, Lord, so that all we think, we do, and all we say will be pleasing to you. Holy Spirit, welcome. And This is our one desire to have your power set our lives on fire. Teach us, move us in all we think and do and all we say. Lead us, guide us. In every step we take along this way, Holy Spirit, reach into our hearts, fill us with the power of your love. Holy Spirit, we want to make a start to heal a troubled world that's torn apart. Great the chasm that 
play between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Told to the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope And we sing hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah That has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living I am healed. 
Blessed Lamb of God, hello and welcome back to the House of Prayer. We continue our series on the names of God today with a look at Adonai, which means Lord and Master. Over the past few weeks, we have looked at two other names of God. We looked at Elohim, Creator God, where we saw His glory, His power, and His majesty. Then we looked at Yahweh, the personal name of God, I am who I am, which describes God's eternal self-existence and his covenant faithfulness, that he's faithful to his promises. And today we're going to look at Adonai, which means Lord and Master. It means that he is owner, owns who? Owns the entire world and owns in us. The psalmist says in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all the people in it, which means that everything in the universe belongs to God, which means that we belong to Him. Now, if God is our owner, what does that make us? Think about it for a minute. If God owns us, what does that make us? It makes us His subjects, it makes us His servants, it makes us His slaves. And I know instantly there is a reaction towards that because we don't like to consider ourselves a servant or a slave to anybody, not even God. And I'm going to prove it to you over this session, which is not going to be an easy session, but I promise you that if you listen to the words that are spoken here today, if you take them to heart and if you put them into practice, your life is going to change beyond recognition and so are the lives of those of the people around you. Now, to prove to you what I meant, I have a preponderance of women here, as always. So here is something, and I'm telling you in advance that this is going to offend you women, all right? But I'm going to do it from Scripture, so you know it's not me who's offending you. If you have any problem, take it up with Peter, all right? So open your Bibles, please, to uh, 1 Peter uh, 3. 1 Peter 3. I'm going to put it up on my screen here, but I really, really would like you to open this in your own Bibles and read it for yourselves, okay? I'm going to give you a moment to get there. This is 1 Peter 3. And in advance, all you women, you are not going to like this, okay? Wives, yeah, and this is especially to those women out there who are married, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past to put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord, called him her Adonai, because that is what it means. The Adonai means Lord. Now, I know the first question you're asking is, what about the husbands? I promise you, I'm going to get to them, okay? But let us just consider this for a moment, wives, okay? Why do you find this so offensive? And I know you do, because I speak to women, and when I talk to them about being submissive to their husbands, there is instant rebellion. 
But it's not only women, it's not only wives that have this problem, it is almost every person who walks upon this earth, that we don't like to be subservient to anybody, not to each other, and most of the time not even to God. We call him Lord and Master, but is that truly who he is to us? I want us to ask ourselves these questions, and through the session, as we answer honestly, as we answer in truth, we will find that God gives us his grace to be able to be submissive, to be able to live a surrendered life. Because when we live a surrendered life to God, there are blessings beyond measure. That our lives are free, that we experience the abundance that Jesus said we would have, and also all the other wonderful things that God says are ours because we are inheritors of God's promise. We are co heirs with Christ which means that we can walk upon this world like the heroes of old, like Sarah and like Abraham. Now, there is a reason I mentioned Sarah, um, that, that we began with Sarah, is because her husband is the first person who actually calls God Adonai in Scripture. Now, most of you know the story of Abraham. You know that God made him a promise that he was going to become a father of nations, and God made this promise to him in Genesis 13, but many years later, Abraham is getting older and older, and this promise is not being fulfilled. So let's pick up the story in Genesis chapter 15, please. So once again, please open your Bibles to Genesis 15, where we're going to um, find our first introduction to 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 Adonai. Yeah, once again, it's on the screen, but I would prefer if you read it from your own Bible. So after these things, you forget about what these things are, the plenty of things, the word of the Lord. Now, you'll notice the Lord is capitalized in all our Bibles, okay? And whenever it is capitalized, as I told you last time, this is a reminder to those of you who are here for the talk on Yahweh and uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, is whenever it is capitalized, it translates as Yahweh, the personal name of God, I am. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham, I am your great shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham, notice his name is Abraham here. Abraham said, O Lord God, and over here you find there is Lord God, Lord is capitalized. So there are two, God, God, yeah? And the second instance of God is Adonai, Lord and Master. And something very important is taking place over here that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But let's continue to read this first. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Now, why are we studying the names of God? <laughs> when we discover the names of God, we discover who God is. We discover his character. We discover his promises. We discover his word. We discover so many things about God. And then we start to walk in the power of God. We discover who he is. And consequently, we discover who we are in him, through him, because of him. So it is important to know this God that we call God, that we say is our Lord. So what Abraham is doing over here, Abram, is doing over here is basically reminding God on one side, reminding God on one side that he is Lord God, he is Yahweh, he is Jehovah Adonai, master, who is responsible for Abraham, because that is a master's duty, is to look after his servant. It is to take care of his servant. It is to provide for his servant. It is to nurture his servant. It is to nourish his servant. That is the master's job. And Abraham over here, Abram over here is telling God, God, you are my master. You made me a promise. And I know that you're going to fulfill that promise. That's on one end. And which is why when we're talking about Elohim, we know that God is the creator of the universe, that God breathed life into everything, creating everything out of nothing. And a God who can do that can do anything. He who knit us together in our mother's womb, he can knit us back together again if by some chance we've come unraveled. When we say Yahweh, we're calling out to the great I am, the covenant keeper. We're saying to him, God, you're the one who made these promises. You're the one who's faithful to these promises, because that is what Yahweh means. 
And over here when Abram is calling out to God and saying, Adonai, he's saying, you're the Lord and you're the master. And we also need to sometimes call out to God as Lord and master, call out to him as Jehovah or Yahweh, if you prefer, call out to him as Elohim and say, God, you said these things, you are these things that describe you, so why are you not doing what describes you? And on the second level, Abraham is acknowledging that this mighty God, this Yahweh, this Jehovah God is his Lord and Master. The question for you now is, is he your Lord and Master? And I'm going to keep asking you this question throughout this session as you discover more and more about what it takes to really believe that Jesus is our Lord and Master. And so keep your heart open and keep answering the question as it keeps being asked. Let's continue reading here. And Abraham said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your own issue shall be your heir. So God brought Abraham outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. He has a man who's almost 100 years old. And God takes him out and shows him the night sky filled with countless stars, stars that, of course, he has created. And he says to this man close to 100 that he's going to have offspring that are as numerous as those stars. If you were in Abraham's place, would you have believed God? And the question is of great importance because God makes us so many promises. God tells us that he's going to do so many things. But do we believe him? When he says that he will bless us, when he says that he will heal us, after all his name is Jehovah Rapha, the healer, who we're going to look at in a couple of weeks' time. When he tells us what he's going to do with us, when he reveals his plans for our lives, do we believe him? Sometimes it seems too grand to be possible. Sometimes it seems incomprehensible that God would choose somebody like us to do great things for him. And so if we don't believe God, then what? Then what? As the author of the letter to the Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please God, who rewards those who seek Him, who rewards those who seek Him, rewards those who believe Him, rewards those who trust Him. And all this seeking and all this trusting all comes down to obedience. So the question for you now is, are you obedient to God? Because you can call somebody Lord and Master until the sun goes down and comes up and goes down a million times. But if you're not obedient to Him, then is He truly your Lord and Master? Once again, I said the question is for you. It's going to keep being asked. And you have to keep answering it as we go along. And if you find the answer is no, I don't want you to feel too bad about it. I just want you to understand that God appreciates honesty. And the truth sets us free. So when we acknowledge that we're not obedient to God, obedient to what? We're going to come to that in a minute. If we're not obedient to God, then <clears throat> to say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've not treated you as Lord and Master, <clears throat> even though I've said Lord, Lord all the time, but I ask you today for the grace to be obedient to you as Abraham was. Let's move to Genesis chapter 17. We're going to do a lot of scripture today, but it's going to be amazing. It's going to be mind-blowing. Now we come to Abram being 99 years old. Is everybody there? Just two chapters down. Genesis chapter 17. 
When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell to his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. This is my covenant with you. Yep, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations, and no longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. What's a covenant? A covenant is a contract made between two parties. One party says they're going to do something, and the other party says they're going to do something too, and the two come into agreement about what they're going to do. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, we find that God makes a covenant with his people. He says, if you keep my word, if you obey my word, I shall be your God, and you will be my people. Whoever honored that, whoever obeyed God, kept the covenant. Obeyed to what extent? Obeyed to complete and total obedience. As you can see in the life of Abraham, who finally had that son, he called Isaac. And as Isaac grew, he grew up into a wonderful young lad whom Abraham loved, obviously. And then scripture says that God went to Abraham and said, you know this son, this only son whom you love, I want you to sacrifice him for me. Abraham did not hesitate. Abraham trusted God. Abraham honored God as his Lord and Master. Abraham took on his role as a servant of God, a slave of God who would listen to his master's command no matter how crazy it might seem. And so he took Isaac up a mountain to be sacrificed. And as they approached the top of the mountain to the sacrificial place, his son Isaac said, there is fire and there is wood, but where is the lamb to be sacrificed? And Abraham said, God will provide. His faith in God was so implicit that he believed that God would do something wonderful. Why? Because Abraham believed the promises of God. And when God said to Abraham, you are going to be the father of nations. And here he was being asked to sacrifice his only son. Abraham still knew that somehow or the other, God was going to fulfill his promise. And whether it was bringing Isaac back to life from the dead or was going to do some miracle to stop him from killing his son, God would do it. And so Abraham was secure in that faith. And I want us to be secure in that faith because once again, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And right enough, as he was about to sacrifice his son, an angel of the Lord stopped him and said, God knows that you love him. God knows that you fear him. God knows that you trust him. There is the ram. Where is the lamb? The lamb was to come. And he came 2,000 years ago, bringing with him a new covenant. And I want to talk about this new covenant for a moment before I get deeper into the subject. A covenant is a contract, as I just explained, between two parties. Now, I have a contract with my landlord. I live here in Dubai. And I can stay in my apartment for a year on the condition that I make quarterly payments to the landlord. So every three months, uh, there's a check that goes to the landlord. And in exchange for that, I can stay here with my wife. And I can do all the things that I'm doing in this apartment. Now, here's a question for you. If I do not pay the landlord, the money that is due to him, and he kicks me out. Is he wrong to do that? Obviously not, because he's fully within his rights, because I have not honored my part of the contract, my part of the covenant. He's not obligated to keep his part of the contract, and here is the problem. 
that we have a covenant with God. We have a covenant that's a wonderful, beautiful, blessed, amazing covenant with God. And we expect God to keep his part of the covenant, whereas we don't care about keeping our part of the covenant. We think we can do whatever we want. We think we can act in whatever manner we please. And God is still obligated to do what he's supposed to do. How does that work? And I want you to think about this for a moment. How does that work? How will that work? And which is why one day when Jesus was celebrating the Last Supper, he took the bread. He gave you thanks and broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, take this all of you and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this in memory of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this so that you will not forget the things I have done for you. After supper was ended, he took the cup. And again, he gave you thanks. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, take this all of you and drink from it. This is the cup of the new covenant. This is the cup of my blood that will be shed for you and for all humankind for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. So what are we supposed to do daily, hopefully, is that every time we receive communion, whatever way your church understands it, every time we commemorate this great sacrifice of God and recall his words, we are recalling what Jesus did for us and Jesus is telling us to remember that when that bread is broken, his body was broken. For what? For the forgiveness of sins. And we don't take forgiveness for granted as something we just get because we say a few words to somebody. But because of his great sacrifice, his passion, his death on the cross, and his subsequent resurrection. And then we're told to remember that his blood, his blood, every drop of his blood was poured out. For what? For us, so that we are cleansed, so that we are restored to a position with God. And that the new covenant is, has been established and that we do not forget that we are people of the new covenant. And yet we forget, right? We forget. We forget what we've inherited as part of the new covenant. We forget that I'm redeemed, I'm saved, I'm restored, I'm forgiven, I'm washed, I'm cleansed, I'm pure, I'm holy, I'm blessed, I'm healed in my soul, in my heart, in my spirit, in my mind, in my body. I am free, I am strong, I'm a child of my Father, I'm a friend of Jesus, and my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. This is what the new covenant is. I did not ask my brother to sing that song. But he took that song anyway because it was related to what I was going to talk about here today. What we are in the new covenant and God says, you don't live like your new covenant people. You don't live like you're redeemed. You don't live like you're, you're, you're pure, purified. You don't live like you're free. You don't live like you're strong. You don't live like you're a child of God. You don't live like your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know, Paul asks? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. And we think we belong to ourselves. Don't we? You're not your own. That's 1 Corinthians six nineteen. if you want to go back and check it. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. And the price was every drop of Christ's blood. He owns you. He owns me. He owns all of us who believe in him. And when we acknowledge that, when we acknowledge that, when we believe that, when we start putting it into practice, he will start putting into practice what his duties are, what his responsibilities are, what his role is to provide for us as a master, to take care of us as a master does, as a good master does. Which brings me to the husbands. We started off with the wives submitting to the husbands. Of husbands were kind and tender, if they were loving and affectionate, if they took care of their wives, as a good master takes care of his servants. I'm going to use the word servant here because I want us to get used to it. If he nurtures her, if he nourishes her, if he respects her, if he honors her, what wife will not listen 
to what her husband asked her to do. But most of us, men or husbands, we just want them to be obedient to us without doing any of these things that are our responsibilities as men and as husbands. We lie, we cheat, we bully, we scold, we punish. We do terrible, terrible things to our wives. and Like a contract, if we don't honor our part, the wife is not obligated to honor hers. Are you listening to me, church? But in order to honor her, we have to honor God. And we honor God only in humility. But we are so proud, are we not? The same night, Jesus told us to remember the new covenant that he made with us. He also dropped down to his knees before sinful man. And he washed his feet. He's not a guru, he's not a great prophet. He's the son of God and yet he stooped before us in humility and he washed our feet. And then he said, you call me Lord and Master and that is what I am. And if I, your Lord and Master, can wash your feet you also should wash one another's feet. And whose feet have you washed lately, my brothers and sisters? You want to rule, you want to dominate, you want to be a leader, even in the church, and you'll fight with each other for that position. You will jockey for positions of power and importance everywhere you are. Where is the feet washing? Where is the humbling? And you see the problem? That God says, I need you to be walking in this world in imitation of me, and we don't do it because we are lords of our universe, and we want God to do things for us when we will not do the things that God asks us to do. And what does he ask us to do? Save the world. The world is perishing at a rapid rate. Every day, thousands of souls are dying without having heard the gospel. And the children of God are sitting on their chairs like they always have, wondering why God is not doing anything to save the world. When he says, I've given you authority to trample over snakes and scorpions, I've given you the commission to make disciples of all nations. I've sent you out there to be my ambassadors. Are you listening to me, church? I hope you are. I hope those hearts are wide open. Because I'm telling you this, and I know it for a fact, that if we are faithful to God, God's faithfulness blesses us so much we will never want for anything in our lives. We will never need for anything in our lives. That God will walk beside us. One day there was a man called Gideon, a God raised out of nowhere. And God called Gideon to fight with the army of the Midianites that were, that were arrayed against them. And for years, these Israelites could do nothing because the Midianites were so strong, were so, were so wicked, they didn't even allow them to grow grain. And the Israelites would cry out to God until God finally came to this man called Gideon and he said, I want you to lead your army. And Gideon said, me? Who am I? I'm the least in my family and my family is the least in my tribe. Who am I? But then God said, I am with you. And Gideon called him by the name that we're learning here, Adonai, Lord and Master. And if you are my Lord and you are my Master and I obey you, then you will fulfill what you're saying you're going to fulfill, which is to give me victory against the army of the Midianites that are arrayed against me. And so Gideon got together an army because he believed in God. And that is what happens when you surrender yourself to God. 
Surrender yourself only in faith because only faith can allow you to surrender, that you trust God implicitly like Abraham trusted him. And so Gideon trusts God because God is a faithful Lord. God is a faithful master. God is a faithful king. And when he gives his covenant, like I said, Yahweh means I am. It's, it's a reminder to us that he is faithful to his promises, that he's faithful to the covenant, that he will honor his word. And so Gideon got ready to go to battle. He gathered together 20,000 men. God told him too many. Tell those who want to go, to go, and most of them left. It was still too many for, for God, even though Gideon's number, army was totally outnumbered. And he whittled it down to 300 men, and he told Gideon, now you go with these 300 men. And God went with Gideon, and Gideon discovered the 300 men with Adonai was greater and more powerful than thousands of men arrayed against him. And this is what I want us to understand. You and Adonai can battle any number of forces of darkness that come against you. And I stand here as evidence of that. God has whittled away, leaving me just with a few. And he's saying these few are enough for you to go to wage, to wage war against the prince of darkness. And because we trust God, the handful of us that are left, we are going to get the victory that God has promised us. The question is, do you want that victory too? It is not enough to say, Lord, Lord. As Jesus says, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not heal the sick in your name and do these mighty miracles in your name? And I always say to them plainly, get away from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. I trembled when I read those words. <laughs> Jesus was not saying, he was saying, I didn't know him. Jesus was saying, he didn't know me. And I said, never, ever do I want that to happen. That it's not enough to raise our hands and say, hallelujah. It's not enough to say, praise you, Jesus, all the time. It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to go to prayer meetings. It's not enough to do all these things that we think we're doing to work miracles in God's name. What God wants to see is if we're obedient to him, if we trust him. When you're in the dark and you're all alone and there's nobody by your side to comfort you, do you trust him? When you're in pain or you're in torment or you're in so much of trouble that you want to give up on life itself, he wants to know, do you trust him? When you're facing struggles and you're facing strife in your life and you're facing obstacles that seem un unsurmountable, he wants to know, do you trust him? And if you trust him, will you put your faith in him, which means will you surrender everything to him? Before you take any decision, will you go to him and say, Lord, is this, this is, what I, this is what I want to do. Will you please help me? Tell me what I need to do. And when we surrender our lives and when we put our faith in him constantly and continuously, day after day, then there is nothing that God will not do for you. But it all begins with acknowledging that he is your Lord. And he is your master. Make him your Lord and Master now. I know that he's not a Lord and Master for many of us. And if he is, it's when it's convenient. Yes, Lord, I will believe you now, but the moment has passed and we return to taking control of our lives. And so something we need to do daily, you wake up in the morning and you give your life to God. You go to bed at night and you look at your life and you see if there's anything that you're still retaining control over, that you still think that you're the Lord of it, and say, Lord, I'm sorry about it. I hand it over to you again. And you do this day after day and you do it often enough and you will find that eventually you are doing what God is asking you to do. Don't let the white servant offend you. I used to have a lady who used to work in our house when I was growing up. 
She used to cook and clean and look after us. And even though she was our servant, if we called her servant, she hated it. She would get very, very angry. And I used to do it if I wanted to annoy her, but most of the time I, I understood that she didn't like it, and we don't like it either. So let us take hope from some great men in the Bible. Every single one of those apostles, every single one of those gospel writers called themselves not a servant, but they called themselves a slave. You'll find Paul in Romans 1, 1 saying, here I am, Paul, a slave, but slave, a servant, but it translates from the Greek word doulos, which means slave, means bond servant, which means that I am a slave. There are no pretenses of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find Peter, 2 Peter 1, 1, starting his letters with the same words, behold, here I am, Peter, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find Jude doing that, Jude 1, 1. We find all the others doing that. And if they could do it, then why can't we? They didn't want to do it in the beginning. In the beginning, they would fight with each other about who is the greatest. Until Jesus called them all and said, haven't you learned anything? You've been with me so long. In the world, if you want to be great, you have to lord it over everybody. But in my kingdom, if you want to be great, you have to be the servant of everybody. Because even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and offer his life as a ransom to many. Let us tell God. It took them some time. It might take us some time. But it all begins with a single step. So let's take that step today. The step is always with repentance. God, I'm sorry. The second step is accepting the forgiveness that automatically follows repentance. And then the request for His grace, because without His grace, nothing is possible. For the grace to be as faithful to Him as Abraham, as Noah, and as all those other great men and women in the Bible were obedient. And like Mary saying, Lord, let your will be done in my life and to mean it. Now there is a song that I love, and it's it's what started this series. For those of you who didn't watch the first two episodes, you'll find them on YouTube. Elohim and 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 Yahweh. Just search for Elohim and Ilarana YouTube, and you'll get the video. Uh, watch those two, and and the very powerful talks like this one. I hope has been. But I, and in that I explained how we were one day worshiping God. And I understood the power that is contained in God's name. And I was listening to the song again a few weeks ago, and I realized there's no prayer in it at all. All it does is call out the names of God. Yahweh, Rapha, Elohim, Shaddai, Adonai. And as we call out the names, it's with the faith that God will manifest himself. And as I tried to explain in those uh, talks that I gave, if God is present, is there anything that we're going to lack? Is there anything that we need? We don't need to ask Him for anything. And that is what Jesus said, when you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who's unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans because they think they will be hurt because of the many words they say. Do not be like them because your Father already knows what you need before you ask Him. So as you close your eyes and as you just worship God, God's presence is manifest. And when God's presence is manifest, you don't need to tell Him, Lord, I need a husband, or I need a wife, I need a job, I need healing, I need deliverance. God knows it all. And in that presence is manifest His power. And through that power, we receive everything that is God's, everything that God wants us to have. And let us receive what God wants us to have today. You want healing, don't you? You want deliverance, don't you? You want blessings, don't you? Forget about all of it. For a few moments, give it all up. Just leave it down. Leave it aside. And for the next five minutes, all I want us to do is just to close our eyes and worship God in the Spirit and in the truth. Just as we are, with all our weaknesses, with all our wickedness, with all our disobedience, with all our rebellion, Let's just go to God as we are, not pretending to be holy, 
not pretending to be good servants, but just going with all humility as we are and as we worship God. He's going to give us supernatural faith, the kind of faith that Abraham had and Noah had and Mary had and the apostles had. It is for us. Let us take it. We're receiving it tonight. God bless us all. You 
God, keep your eyes closed for a moment longer. Stay with God, enjoy His presence. Where His presence is manifest, His power is manifest, His peace is manifest, His love is manifest. We make our Christian journey so difficult sometimes when all that is needed is to remain in the presence of God as much as we can. And for those of us who know how to do it, we can make this permanent every minute of every day of our lives. Think of how you feel now. Is there anything that troubles you, anything that worries you? Are you afraid of anything? The pain that was in your hearts or your minds or your bodies is gone. The worries and the anxieties the troubled you, disturbed you, give you sleepless nights is gone. The obstacles that stood in your path, the mountains that blocked you from moving forward, they're gone, they count for nothing during this time. And the secret is simply to remain in the presence of God all the time so we can live in the freedom that God wants us to live in. Remember now and always that we are children of the new covenant. In the old days, people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob lived like heroes. People like Gideon and Ezekiel and Isaiah. And they were just people belonging to an old covenant where God said, if you keep my commands, I will be your God and you will be my people. We're more than being people today. We're children of God. And if they could live with so much a power in the old covenant, how much more should we today live as children of God? But to be a child of God is to live in imitation of God, and that is to live in humility, in obedience, leading lives of service to God and to one another, not to think of ourselves as above any, every, anybody, but to think that our role is just to serve everybody. And when we walk in this world like Jesus did, there is nothing that God will not deny us because he truly is a faithful God. He is truly Yahweh. So Lord, we thank you for this time and we thank you for the words that went out tonight. We thank you that you've given us a fresh understanding of what it means to be a servant. And we graciously accept this role, Lord, saying that not just servants, we are your slaves, you are our master. We will listen to you, we will follow you wherever you ask us to go, and we will obey you no matter what you tell us to do. All we ask, Lord, is for your grace to be upon us and for your presence to be around us always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can open your eyes now. <laughs> Told you it was going to be a good session, yeah? So I hope you enjoyed it. Please share the video with your friends. And um, next week, um, we'll be back continuing our series on deliverance. And I'll be back the week after that with a look at Jehovah Rapha, God, our healer. And God says that he's going to heal us. So he's going to heal us, right? 
Okay, so we're going to end with a song of thanksgiving. Please, let's thank God before we leave here tonight. Brother Mervyn, thank you for being with us. Thank all of you for being here. Uh, final song. Thank you, Lord. I come before you today. Everybody. And there's just one thing that I want to say. Thank you, Brother Marvin, and thank you, everybody else. God bless you all. Good night.